Hello and welcome everybody, this is Roland from GraphicInMotion.com and it is tutorial time again. In this tutorial I want to give you a basic introduction to Vellum inside Houdini. I want to show you a basic Vellum setup inside the SOPS context, so in Surface Operator Networks. I will show you the most important nodes that you need for a Vellum simulation. I also want to go over the most important parameters that you can change to achieve certain behavior of your simulation. We will take a look on setups with multiple vellum objects like blob and soft bodies within one simulation. And I also want to show you how you can influence your simulations by forces. Then I want to go quickly into vellum inside dot networks, so in dynamic operator networks. And in the end, I also want to go briefly over the shelf tools that we have in Houdini that can also help you to create Vellum networks and node setups. But I think it's important that in the beginning, you really learn how to build these manually, because if you just start with the shelf tools, then you do not really know how things work. And this makes it even more difficult and more confusing. So this tutorial should be really suitable also for Houdini beginners, but I also want to include some tips and tricks for Houdini users who have some experience and who want to get a little bit deeper into Velo. So let's get started with our first setup. Let's take a look at a very simple volume simulation in Houdini. I will close the shelf tools because I will not use this now. We will start inside our SOPS context, so in the surface operators. So we can just lay down a geometry node and call this our simulation. And I will dive inside. You can press I on your keyboard to dive inside a node and you can press U to go back out, I, in, and you, up. So let's dive inside our simulation. Now, what are the basic nodes that you need to create a Vellum simulation? There are actually two nodes that you need. And this is a Vellum constraint node. So let's add this now, the Vellum constraints node. And you need a Vellum solver. So let's add the Vellum solver. Let's take a look at these. You see that both of these have three inputs and three outputs. The first one, if you take a look down here, says it's the vellum geometry input. The second one is the constraint geometry input. And the third one is the collision geometry input. So let's just link these up. And now, of course, we need something to feed into our simulation. So we want to create a geometry. In my case, I will use a planar patch. Planar patches are these kind of grids that are triangulated. And this is actually really good for cloth simulations. So I want to use this one. But I want to make it a little bit bigger, 2 times 2 meters. And I also want the resolution to be better, that we have more geometry to work with. And I set it to 0.05. Let's lay it flat here into our scene on the ZX plane. And let's move it up, let's say, by 2 meters. I press spacebar and H to frame my scene. Now, if I feed this patch here into our volume constraints here and activate this network, then you see now this should go away because now the constraint node is happy because it has a geometry input. Now, what does this chain actually do? If we take a look at the constraints, this is creating constraints. What are constraints? If we activate the flag here, you will see these white lines. And these white lines are actually the constraints that are created by this node. Constraints are connections or primitives, like lines, that have certain parameters. They have stretch value, they have stiffness values, they have bend values. And changing these values, they also have a length and a weight and a mass and the thickness. And by changing all of these values, we will go into this a little bit later, you can achieve different behaviors. But with this node, you cannot only create the constraints that you see here, you can create different constraints. Actually, with this Vellum constraints node, you can create all constraints that are available in Vellum. 
And you can change this right here in the constraint type. If you take a look here, you have a many different constraints. We have distance along edges, that's the one that's selected right now, and this is why these white lines are following along the edges of our geometry exactly. You have bend across triangles. You see this looks totally different. Now it creates these, yeah, these constraints that are um, moving over our triangles. You have cloth, which is actually a combination of both of these. You have hair constraints. You have string constraints and yeah, many different constraints. We will not go through all of this in this basic introduction. But if you want to learn more about Vellum in Houdini and the different constraint types, I invite you to check out my premium Houdini course called Vellum Playground. It is available on my website and the link is now on screen. You can also find it in the video description. In this course, you will learn all aspects of vellum, like cloth simulation, soft bodies, balloon inflation. We will take a look at string and hair simulations, but I also want to cover grains and fluids, as well as a number of other Houdini-related topics. So this course is not finished yet, but I will release a new part every two weeks. This premium course, all the project files and supplementary resources are available if you support me on Patreon. To get access to the course and everything that I create, please choose the full access tier. I'm really thrilled to announce that this is my first premium course, but with your support, I intend to create more in the future and I want to make more great learning content for you guys. So I'm really grateful for all of your support and I really hope that you continue to enjoy my work. But for now, let's just choose the cloth constraint to create some cloth. By the way, if you want to visualize only the constraints, because right now we see the geometry and the constraints, you can just apply or add a null to your constraint stream. So this is the constraint stream here in the middle. This is the geometry stream. Here the geometry gets passed through our simulation and this is the constraint stream. And this one, there's nothing connected right now, is the collider geometry uh, stream. So if I activate this now, you see I only have my constraints visible now. The geometry is not displayed now. Sometimes this is helpful to visualize only the constraints. And it's also important to remember that constraints are primitive objects. Okay, these are the constraints. But what are they doing now? So with this simulation setup now, if I just select my solver, and the solver is of course the node that is calculating all of these constraints behavior. So if I activate this and then press play, which you can actually do by pressing the up arrow, then it just falls down. And I can reset it by pressing control and the up arrow. It falls down because the vellum solver also has some forces applied. And forces here in the forces tab also always have an influence on our simulation. In this case, we have a force gravity. So it falls down. That's simple. You can also apply directional forces like wind. You can apply wind drag, which is actually like air resistance. And you have some other options that we don't go into right now. For now, I just want to keep some of these points in place that we can create a nice cloth here. To pin some points in place, let me switch to my top view by pressing space and two. And let's go to our constraints. If you take a look here at the constraints, and we'll go through some of these settings later, but for now, let's just jump to this pin to animation. Here I can select some pin points. So let me just zoom out a little bit here. I will select this arrow here, and now I can just select with a rectangular selection some points and press enter inside the viewport. And you see all the point numbers now are added here. You can also do this by groups. And let's go back to space one, to our standard view. Now, if I run my simulation, you see these points are now pinned and will not be influenced by the gravity or by the solver. So now I have this cloth-like behavior. Now let's take a look at our collider stream here. So let's add in a collision object and yeah, the best collision object or a nice collision object is, of course, a torus. So let's add it into our scene. And we can connect it to the collision geometry input here. Let's move it up a little bit. So move it up from the center. 
and maybe also move it over a bit like so. Now, if I press play, you can guess what's happening. Our cloth will collide with our collision geometry. If you want this collision geometry to be visible, because right now it is not, this is just a representation. And actually this is created by the Vellum solver. So if you go here and go to visualize, you see here you have show collision. And if you turn this off, then this will be gone. It will still work, so it will still uh, run. Let me actually activate my real-time play. You see, it's still colliding, but it's not visible anymore. But if you want to see the collision object, you would have to put in a merge node in here and then just merge the two geometry streams. So the vellum geometry stream and the collision object. And let's actually increase this resolution a little bit. That it looks a little bit nicer, like so. And now we have this nice simulation and you see that it runs nearly in real time. So it's really fast. Good, let's delete this null because this null is a bit confusing. It's really just a visualizer. So this is probably the most basic Vellum setup that you can create. Just a one constraint node, one Vellum solver, one geometry to deform and one collision geometry. And the merge node just brings everything together that you can see it in the viewport. So let me name this a basic Vellum simulation. If you want to get this file, you can also get this on Patreon. I will really write a nice documentation, so I will organize this file and make it as useful as possible that you can come back to it and yeah, look up the setups that we will create during this tutorial. Before we jump into our next setup, I want to show you two more nodes that are important for Vellum simulations. And these are called Vellum IO. So Vellum IO is a special cache object for Vellum simulations and Vellum post process. And you usually set them up like this. So let's delete this merge for a moment and let's connect our Vellum IO here to our solver. And with the Vellum IO, you can save your Vellum simulations to disk. You could also use a simple file cache node to save your simulation to disk. So let's bring in a file cache node and let's take a look at the differences. You see that this only has one import. So if you want to use a file cache, if you only want to save the geometry stream, then you can use a file cache. If you want to save also the constraints, then I would recommend that you use a Vellum IO. So right now the Vellum IO is, yeah, like any other uh, file cache or, or a saving node inside Houdini. You can specify a path here, constructed or explicit. I don't want to go into too much details here, but this is where you save your simulation actually. And then you can of course also specify a range. Right now there is an automatic expression in here that links it to our project range. If you delete this, right click and choose delete channels, then you can just put in a manual frame range. And then you can save to disk and this will save out all of the information inside of our Vellum simulation to disk. So now let's just look at the next node. This is the Vellum post process one and we can connect this here. Vellum post process just gives you a few options to change or to improve the quality of the simulation after actually processing it. So it processing happens here. So this is the, the node that calculates everything. Here you can save it and now you can post-process it. You can, of course, also link this post-process directly to the solver without saving it to disk. So we do not really need this in here. That's optional. Now, Vellum post-process has some interesting features. And to show you these, I will just run my simulation uh, a little bit. First of all, you have the option to blur your simulation. You see, if I do this now, a little bit is happening here, so it gets a bit smoother. If you have a very wrinkly simulation, um, you can smooth it out a little bit. Then there is also the option to subdivide your simulation. In our case, I would choose loop because we have a triangulated mesh and this will just make it smoother. So this can also be a good workflow. You use a geometry that it's not so high resolution and then you just subdivide it later on with the Vellum post process. Then we have some collision correction. We do not go into these right now, but I want to show you the extrude by thickness. 
And this actually will lead us to important parameters of volume simulations. You see, we have uh, extrude by thickness, and here's the thickness scale. So Vellum somehow calculates already a thickness. And if I bring in my torus, let's create a merge node here. Again, just to bring in the torus, make this visible. So let's take a look at this. You see here that it is really colliding with the surface of my torus. If I turn off the volume, the volume post-process, you see that there's actually this gap. And this is because volume calculates a thickness. And you can visualize this thickness by using the volume post-process. And you can set up this thickness inside the constraint nodes. And now I want to go over the most important parameters of a simulation. This is really only touching the surface. Again, if you want to learn more, if you want to really dive deep into these uh, topics, then I would recommend to go to my website, graphicinmotion.com, or to my Patreon. There I have a special Vellum course. But now let's just take a look where we can set up this thickness. And if you take a look at the constraints node, Right here, we have these two tabs. There is mass and there is thickness. Right now, they are unchanged. That means it's just a standard value that is applied. You can set this to set uniform, and then you can just specify a thickness all over your cloth. You can set this to calculate the uniform. This, I don't know exactly how it works, but it calculates uh, thickness and takes the actual geometry typology into account. And then you can calculate varying, and this also has to do with the typology of the geometry that you feed into it. But for now, we can just use set uniform just to take a look what this does. Let's reset our simulation for a moment, and let's change this. So the value that we have now is 0 0.01. If I make this way thinner, and let's actually visualize the thickness, you can do this as well. So let's go up here, space H, and let's make sure that we are actually on our, the, the visibility flag is on our constraints node. You see all these tiny spheres now, these blue ones. And these represent the thickness of my cloth. And it's very important not to go too thick because if these intersect like this, this may cause problems for the simulation. And that's where these calculate uniform come into play because these actually take a look at the geometry and if we take a look now at our constraints, we cannot see them right now, unfortunately, but I think that the edge length scale means that now we are creating a thickness here that is 25% of the length of these edges. If I set this to one, you see that they are now nearly as long as these edges without them intersecting. So this is something like a scale value, if you want to see it like this. And this has to do with the resolution of your geometry. So if I go into my planar patch now and reduce this even further, then you will see that also the thickness will change. Now it recalculates and you see now these spheres are smaller. So this calculate uniform is actually depending on the size of your triangles or of your quads on your meshes. But let's go back here to 0 0.05, that's enough, and let's go back to set uniform, we want to specify the thickness ourselves and let's make it really thin, just as a quick example. You see now we have these very, very tiny points here. And if we run the simulation now, go to our Vellum Solver, run it again, and then let's take a look what the post process does. You see now it is really thin and you can also see this uh, on the collision geometry. If we now activate our Vellum post process, you see that the thickness now is looking like that. So this is a very important parameter. Let's take a look at other parameters that are important and I will just press actually Shift W to make my geometry visible again. This may be useful now. And let's set this back to 0 0.01. Now, the mass is also important. Mass, you can also do the same settings here. Set uniform, calculate uniform, calculate varying. This again takes your geometry into account. And this is the weight. So the higher you set this, the heavier your material or your geometry actually is. So if I set this to one, then you see 
already that the wrinkles look quite different. You know, here in this part of the simulation, you see that the force here definitely drags down way more because this is now heavy. So here you can simulate like a heavy, thick cloth, like leather. And if you set it to a very low value, like 0 0.01, for example, then you can simulate very light materials, as you can see here. Now we nearly get no wrinkles because it's so light. And this also has an influence, of course, on forces, if we take a look at that later on. Let's revert this back to the defaults. You just right click and then you can revert to defaults. You can also hold down control and middle mouse button and this will revert this back to the defaults. So now I don't want to change the mass. I will just use the default mass of 0 0.01. Good. So these are mass and thickness. These are two very important, important values or in Houdini, we're always talking about attributes, so I should use this name. So these are very important attributes that control how our cloth is behaving. Another very important attribute is, of course, the stretch stiffness. And you see, these values can also be very confusing for beginners. So these, these strange setups here with uh, scaling something with strange numbers. So what does this really mean? Uh, let me explain you this setup. Here you have a value and this is multiplied by these values here. And you see that 1e e plus 10 means is a 1 with 10 zeros. So this is a very high number. Uh, this is 1 million. This has 6 zeros. Then we have 7, 8, 9, 10. So this is more or less an infinite stiffness. And that means that the size of our triangles will not stretch. It's very obvious that these don't stretch. You see that the size of our triangles doesn't change. The gravity is pulling down, but it nearly doesn't change. A tiny, tiny bit. They are a little bit stretchy, but uh, nearly nothing is happening. So to change this, you can just come in here and really in, in let's say, 80-90% uh, of the cases, I only use these scalar values to change my stretch stiffness. So if I put this to 1, then now my value of the stretch stiffness is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. So this is a very low value. Let's see what happens when I put in this very low value. You see, everything is falling apart because now our triangles are, or our constraints, I should actually say, are not stiff enough anymore to hold my geometry together. Now they are creating this really horrible mess. And let's increase this step by step to see what these values really change. So if I set it to 10, still a horrible blobby something mess here. Set it to 100. It gets better. You see now it's very rubber-like and very yeah stretchy, but it, it at least it keeps somehow its shape. And so you see these values here, if I set it to 1000, then we will get a decent result already. So you see that these values specify how this works. And if you want to have something in between, for example, if 1000 is a little bit too stiff for your taste, but 100 is not stiff enough, then you can always come here and change this multiplier. And if you set this to 5, then 5 times 100 is, of course, 500. So you have a stretch stiffness of 500. And this will be exactly in between. So this is the stretch stiffness. Let's set this back to a high value, something like 1 million, and set this back to 1. And this will give us a quite stiff result, like a cloth. Okay. Then damping ratio just means that you can damp some energy out of that. If we set this to a really high value, you will see if I run this then, yeah, it's not that obvious, but damping always means that you take out energy of your simulation. If you have very chittery parts, then you can use damping. The rest length is a very interesting value. This is also very important. If the rest length is set to one, then the length or the size of your constraints will try to be one all the time. If we set it to 0 0.5, you will see something very interesting happening as soon as I, oops, as soon as I start my simulation. So you see now it shrinks down. So why is that? Because the size, the rest length of my constraints is now set to 0 0.5, so 50% of its original size. So everything shrinks and stretches together. And with the rest length you can do really cool things. So 
right now, yeah, this looks a little bit strange, but for example, if we set it to 1.1, so make it a little bit bigger, then you can get nice folds. So if you take a look at this now, this nearly looks like a curtain because now it can grow. So all of these constraints will grow a little bit, exactly 10%, and this will create, of course, folds. So this is very good to create wrinkly uh, cloth. If I set this higher, 1.2, let's, let's make one more example. You see, I get even more wrinkles and even more folds. So rest length scale, very important. Let me mention one thing at this point in time. You cannot animate these values on the constraints because now you think, well, cool, then I can just animate it from, let's say, 1 to 2. We can try it out. Let's hold down Alt and let's set a keyframe on frame 1. Let's quickly turn off our simulation calculation. So you can do this here. Just turn it off because then I can just shift my time without the solver calculating anything. And let's say on frame 72, I want to set it to 2. Hold down Alt, set a keyframe. And now we would expect this to grow and to create a lot of wrinkles. But as you can see, let's turn this on again here, our calculation. What will happen here is nothing. And this is a very important thing. Let's now just right click and delete the channels and set this back to one. This is a very important thing to know about vellum. The solver actually only takes in the values that you set up here but it does not take changes into account that you apply here. There are some exceptions, but I don't want to go into these right now. But generally, these constraints are just you set them up, you feed them into the solver, and the solver just uses these values. There are, of course, options and possibilities to change this during the simulation. But if you want to learn this, then please check out uh, Patreon, because this is uh, advanced techniques, and I will cover this in my Vellum Playground course. But now let's take a look at the next important parameter or attribute, and this is the bend stiffness. So bend stiffness, uh, the stretch stiffness controls the size of our triangles, so how far they stretch or how big they are, the rest length. And the bend stiffness controls the angle between our constraints. So you see, this is set to uh, quite a low number now. It's 1 times 0 0.1, so our band stiffness is 0 0.1. If I set this up very high and then run the simulation, you will see that it nearly creates no folds at all. Now, this is nearly like paper now, you see? And even if I increase the rest length scale here to 1.1, and this created nice wrinkles before, you see, it will do something, but yeah, the band stiffness is so so stiff now that there are really no angles happening between these constraints. Let's set this back to 1 and let's lower our band stiffness. You see our value before was 0 0.1. If I go down 0 0.001, you will see another behavior. So let's take a look at that. Now we get way more wrinkles. If you take a look at this and I will just shift W to turn off my, my mesh lines. You see, now we get really a lot of wrinkles. And if I turn on my post process now and subdivide this, you see that this looks actually quite nice. So the band stiffness is an attribute that controls the angle, how far these will bend. And if we go even lower, at some point it will definitely break. This is happening with these values. Then it will create very strange results. But you see, now we have even even stronger folds. And this, of course, also heavily depends on the geometry that you feed into it. But this is always the case with volume simulations. So if we make this really more resolution, let's set this back actually. You can always escape out. So press escape if your solver is running while you do changes. That's not that good. So make sure that you are just on frame one if you want to make changes. Now let's run the simulation again. And I think it should come back to us. I hope so. Yeah, now it calculated this. And now something very interesting is happening. And actually, this is good that this is happening because then I can tell you what I did now. What I did now is that my pinpoints changed because I changed the resolution of my planar patch. If I go to my points with the point numbers, you see this is now very dense. And remember when I set up the pinpoints here on the vellum constraints, it really saved these points. And now these point numbers are just distributed completely differently because I increased the resolution of my 
my planar patch quite a bit. So now only this, this corner here is pinned. Let's turn this off again. And now the simulation looks a little bit different. But it doesn't matter because what I wanted to show you is just how wrinkly this now gets with a high, high count of polygons and with a low value of bent stiffness. You see, now you get real wrinkles. And if we start to do this now and put in 1.1 here and run the simulation again, and by the way, it's really cool how fast Vellum is because you see that it still runs quite smoothly here. You see, you get really, really a lot of detail in here. And if we use the Vellum post process now and subdivide this even more, but actually the subdivision doesn't even doesn't even do so much here. But now I can show you the spatial blur. So if I blur this now a little bit, you see that this now just erases some of the wrinkles. And yeah, this is bend stiffness and stretch stiffness. I think in this case, the bend stiffness is too low. So I would set this to 0 0.01. And then we can just run the simulation again. Let's take a look what this does, what this creates. And this will create quite nice folds, I think. Yeah, definitely. This looks really nice. Like a thin sheet of cloth. And then we can smooth it out a little bit with the vellum post process and we have a very nice setup. And actually it is too thick for this kind of a thing. So we should go in here and also change the thickness. Let's do this and just set the thickness to 0 0.002, let's say. And let's run the simulation once again, and then we will go to our next setup. So this looks quite nice. Yeah, and by the way, just to show you this, if I want to restore my pinpoints, I can do this, of course, even with this geometry here. So let's go into our constraints node. Let's make our points visible and let's turn off the thickness visualizer because this will just confuse us. And I can just specify a new pinpoint group by clicking the arrow coming in here, selecting these points, pressing enter. And now if I go back to my Valium simulation and turn off my points, this will be now pinned again and I have more or less the setup that I had before. So if you want to change the resolution, then it's maybe better to generate a pin group. And I want to also show you this now. So let's take a group node. And we actually want to create the group node before our constraints. So let's Put it in right here after our geometry and with this group node i can now set it first of all to points because we need uh, point groups and now i could use instead of this base group i could use include by bounding region so we select this and now i have a bounding box and if i take a look where it is it's down here now so let's bring it up our bounding box now let's make it smaller because i really want to pin only a few points. So we'll make it really small, 0 0.01. And, but I want it to be bigger on the side axis. So let's set it to two. So just that we have enough here. That's fine. And now I can move it. I can actually also do this right here. When I toggle this icon here, I can move it right here. I could come over here and zoom in a little bit. Let's actually make it a little bit bigger so that it's not so hard to grab these. And now you can just shift it so that this edge is selected and you can now call this your pin group. And this will now store all these points in this group. And instead of using the points directly in here, you can just specify the pin group. Actually, if I do this now, it will store both the values and the pin group. So double click here, delete everything, and then do this again, choose the pin group. Now it is set only to this pin group. The cool thing now, if I start my volume simulation, it will do what we expect. Um, let's select this. It will pin these. But now if I go in and change the resolution, so from 0 0.02 to 0 0.05 again, and you see now the group will still work because we just used the bounding region and I still have these pinned. So now I will not use uh, lose my pinpoints and the simulation still works. So this is also yeah one thing to remember. 
Good, so this was our first part with the very basic Vellum setup and with the most important attributes that are available in Vellum and Vellum constraints. Now let's move on to the next part and there we will create a Vellum simulation with multiple objects and we will also take a look how we can combine multiple constraint types in one simulation. Mm -hmm.